Welcome to Le Rendez-vous. My name is Garance Doré and I'm a writer with so many stories to tell and ideas to share that I created this special moment to talk about all the things that are going on in our lives. So come, let's spend a moment together. Le Rendez-vous is brought to you by Doré, the skincare line I co-created, wanting to bring more simplicity and efficacy to our lives. Check out the end of the episode for a special code just for you, the Rendezvous listeners. In part one of the series about aging, I started talking to you about our looks as we age. And you probably saw that I have so much to say about it. Obviously, one of the reasons is I myself am going through it as we all are, but this subject definitely comes more in focus after you turn 40. Many, many questions come to the surface, whether it's about our looks, about our projects in life, the wisdom that we develop. And in this part two, it's a little bit like an extension of part one. And I thought that we would get the question of looks out of the way, because it's such a big question in our culture. And so today I'm going to talk about the things that people do to age gracefully, whatever that means for them. There is a lot of different approaches, and I think it's important to know what's out there so we can make informed choices and pick what's best for us without judgment, moral superiority or inferiority, and just feeling free that we are the one to decide the way we physically age. Of course, a lot of it is not in our control. And I think that's the first thing to always think about. It's that aging gracefully, the number one thing, and I'll come back to that all the time, whether it's talking about the mental health, whether it's talking about our physical body, our appearance, our style. A big part of the process of aging is about letting go. There are so many things that just don't work anymore as we age. And that's completely fine because new things work and we're different. But it's important, I think, to take all of this as a path of discovery of ourselves and also as a way to smooth our impression of control so that we prepare for our older days. So what do people do today to conceal aging? And I'll try to pepper that a little bit in all the episodes I'll do about aging. But my number one thing is that there is no superior way of doing it. There are ways that we like and embrace depending on our personalities and cultures. And there are other ways that are not really our thing. Of course, I'm the first one to be horrified when I see terrible plastic surgery results on celebrities, for example, because they're the people that we see the most easily online. But I also know that the ones that do great plastic surgery are never discovered. They don't have to talk about it because the sign of beautiful plastic surgery is that it goes unseen. Nobody will see it. I also want to say that I color my hair and that's a personal choice. And coloring one's hair is already a way to conceal one's aging. So where is the moral line? Some people say I would never cut into my body. Some people say I would never inject anything. Other people say I'd never use lasers, anything that destroys the integrity of my body. I think it's very personal. And that's how I want to enter this conversation. So number one, and you might be surprised by how much I know about it, is what happens to our body and face as we age? I'm going to talk about men and women, and I'm going to talk for an hour of yeah, our, our body, because as I explained in part one of this series, our posture, all these things are super important. But there is also obviously the quality of our skin and our bones. And I'm not going to go into the interior stuff that has to do more with exercise, because again, I'm definitely not a doctor. So what happens with our skin, number one, is that it gets thinner and softer. You've probably seen that in your mother, your grandmother. My grandmother had skin at the end of her life that was a bit like paper, you know, very, very thin and 
very beautiful. You couldn't see pores on it. The thing that happens too is that depending on our body type, we can get wrinkles, we can get stains, and we can also get sagginess. Just a little note that it really depends. So for example, in my family, we don't have too many wrinkles. I do have a lot of wrinkles around my eyes just because of my eye shape. But in general, it's not something that you see a lot in my family. My grandmother had no wrinkles. What we have though, and usually that's how it works, is that we'll have more sagging. Things can tend to drop more easily. So if you see, let's say, somebody like Françoise Sagan, who's a French singer that you've probably seen on all your Pinterest, she's now probably in her late 70s, and she's somebody that has a very good bone structure that's also more on the lean side, and she's somebody that will develop a lot of wrinkles that are actually really beautiful. She's aging incredibly beautifully, but she won't have much sagging. Everything feels like it's really staying in the right place. So those are just different types. And that's also why I think when we think of aging, we shouldn't fight things just on a local level, but understand our body structure, our body type, and what's going to look good for us. So obviously, sagginess means things fall, whether it's our eyelids, whether it's even the um, arches of our eyebrows, things tend to go down just because of simple gravity. And that also is when a strong bone structure is definitely some help to keep the same looks when we age. We talk right now so much about jawline. I don't know how this came to become such an important topic on faces, but it's, I get it. A very defined jawline is something that is a sign of youthfulness. And that's also something that will fade as we age. Of course, our breasts can sag, our bottoms can fall. You know, there is this kind of real direction towards the ground. And one thing that surprises a lot of people when I tell them that has been uncovered recently by the hype around the lip lift is that our mouths also do fall <laughs> and sag, meaning that the distance between the bottom of our nose and our top lip tends to extend. So if you look at photos of your grandma, it's something that kind of comes down. And that comes back to something that I was talking about in episode one, which is the importance of taking care of your teeth. Because unless you want to go down the plastic surgery route, which is not always a good idea, and which is a question of personal taste, what will happen is that as you age, it's your bottom teeth that will be more visible as you speak. And that also comes back to what I was talking about, the fact that we don't look at ourselves the way that we move and evolve and grow, the way we speak, all those things. And people can be very surprised when they realize that actually when they speak, what most people see is not their top teeth, which is what they would look at when they check their smile, but it's their bottom teeth. And a lot of people don't take care about their bottom teeth as much as they do their top teeth. Are you getting surprised now how precise I am about everything? I haven't even gone into gum quality and how to take care of your gums and all that, but that's another subject. So as you get older, the mouth comes down and your expressions will change. One other thing that changes, and I'm sorry, this sounds really grim, but it's not. It's a beautiful process. It's the process of life. And actually, a lot of women, a lot of people find themselves better looking in their 50s than they ever were in their 20s. It's a real thing. And I'm very happy to tell you that because it's very true. And I think I myself feel better now than I've ever felt. Then there is volumes. We lose fat and collagen. And that's where we can start seeing hollowness around the eyes, under the cheekbones, and in different places, depending on how our body evolves. And that's something that can make us look tired and that make us feel like the process of aging is really underway. The last thing is lines that show in areas that are overstimulated, like for example, the frown lines and other things like that, that depend on the people. 
Some people frown a lot. Some people show a lot of lines on their forehead. Some people is more the bottom of the face. So it really depends. But the first question to ask ourselves before saying, I want to fight that, I want to look like I'm 20, is take an honest assessment with ourselves and maybe the people around us that love us. And instead of saying, oh, wow, I have sagginess here, I have hollowness there, I have a wrinkle here, is to take a loving look at ourselves and be honest and see what actually looks nice and what doesn't. Because aging is not only negative stuff, some stuff we can actually quite like. For example, Charlotte Rampling really likes uh, her heavy eyelids. For men, I know that someone like Anthony Bourdain just started looking better as he was aging with his gray hair. And of course, that's something that's always quite easier for men, even if things are finally changing. But even someone like my husband, who's bald, because, you know, very easy to see he lost his hair. I don't know, I think it was in his mid-30s or, yeah, mid-30s, early 40s. And actually, when I look at photos of him, I think he looks better now. And if he had been totally attached to, I just want to look the way that I was looking when I was young, he might have been one of these men that go have hair grafts and all that. And I know a few of them, and it's starting to look better. The technologies are getting really wonderful. But men that used to do that 20 years ago were kind of missing the plot because the technique definitely wasn't where it is now. I think it's very important to ask ourselves the question, how do I look from my age, from where I stand, without just thinking, I want to be the person I used to be. I want to look like I'm 20 years old. Beauty is youth. It's not at all that. Beauty is also accepting the changes and being able to see what makes us more beautiful now than what was before and also kind of see, okay, I'm totally on board with that part. I know a lot of women really love that they lose volume in their cheeks, but I'm not so happy about that part. And then kind of decide what we're doing. And I think those are little keys to graceful aging. It's not about trying to reverse the clock. It's not about going crazy and granular on every little thing that's changing. It's about taking the long view, looking at ourselves as a whole, looking at the stories we want to keep telling. For example, I've been offered Botox for around my eyes and I don't really want to change the fact that it's very wrinkly around there because it's just the shape of my eyes. It's I smile a lot and I'm not opposed to any small interventions. But for this, I'm like, no, I just, just want to keep it. Personally, my approach and what I've felt is that what we don't like as much are the things that make us look constantly exhausted, constantly worried. So I think once we've seen, okay, I like that about me, I like that sign of aging and I'm going to keep it, for example... I've loved my freckles since I was a kid. I've never had a problem with that. I always thought it was charming. And now at my age, at almost 48, some of my freckles are definitely sun stains. I have them, I see them, and in some ways, I quite like them. And also there is a deal that I have to do there. If I wanted to have my sun stains removed through laser, it would get rid of my freckles as well, which it, to me is a big part of my personality. So I'm sure that in 10 years, there'll be lasers that will be able to make the difference between freckles and sun stains. And maybe at this moment, I will use them. But those are things that I'm deciding to keep right now until maybe it becomes something that really bothers me. So there are the things we like and that we want to keep. Actually, before I move forward, I think it's actually very important to decide that there are a few things that we're going to just embrace. I think that's a way towards aging beautifully. For example, the fact that Graham, my husband, is somebody that completely embraces aging, to me that makes him sexy and that makes him someone that's not frightened. And that feels strong. And I want to have the same thing as I age, even though I'm ready to make a few concessions if something's really bothering me. All right, so... 
just because I could talk about this for millions of hours and I'm trying to stay as concise as possible. Here are three or four, maybe, different directions that one can choose to go. The first one is to let it go and to do our best with our health and lifestyle and to just sit back and observe ourselves aging with a sense of wonder and with maybe a sense of less self-obsession that we've been used to in our society. I know a few women that are embracing aging that way with that sense of awe and curiosity and that love for the process. And I really admire them and I'm not going to go into the psychology of all this in this episode, but I think it's very determined by the way we were raised, the values in our family, how porous we are to the messages of society. All these things really have a meaning to the way we let ourselves or not let ourselves age. The second direction is to decide to only use a few of the million tools that are at our disposal today and maybe to set a clear line in the sand, which I know a lot of people have, about the things we'll do and the things we won't do. Some people will never cut into their skin if they don't have to. They will never do anesthesia unless they really have to for life and death reasons. Some people just have very strong values about that. And in that case, there are many things that are offered to us, whether it's with skincare, for example, if we're talking about skin, I also really believe in the power of makeup. I don't know if I repeat that enough, but as we age, it's not about piling on more makeup, but choosing a few things that work for you, I think is very important. I think in the last few years, this obsession for perfect skin has driven people a little bit crazy because natural skin is not supposed to be perfect. And so in my opinion, it is better to have great makeup and to be groomed than to try to go through too many interventions, to have no pores, to have no stains, to have nothing, because it's very aggressive to the skin, actually. That said, there are many tools. Some of them are proven. Others, I'm not sure if they work or if it's just suggestibility, but collagen supplements apparently really help the skin. I've done that a few times and I always feel like there is an improvement. You can do face yoga, face gym. Some people really swear by that. Norma Kamali, I don't know if you remember that interview I did with her, was talking about face acupuncture. She said that it completely changed her face for the better. There is obviously nutrition. And then things like lasers, which I'll put in our next section, because it's a little bit different and and it can be pretty extreme interventions depending on the laser we choose. This approach, I feel, is also what people socially are okay talking about because for them it's the idea of staying natural, right? Which I think is such a weird concept because what is the limit? Is a laser not plastic surgery? Sure, not that way, but it's also something that modifies your skin and goes pretty deep in the layers of your skin. So I don't like to really talk about natural beauty in that way. I think that we kind of decide what is natural and what is not on these. It's just too personal. The third way is lighter interventions. You've all heard about lasers, Botox, fillers, and that could be a full episode. And I'm looking at my time now and I'm like, oh God, there is so much. I'm going to try to go a bit quicker. Lasers are usually here for things like tightening the skin, clearing it out of sun stains. But as I said, it will also take care of your freckles if you have any. Minimizing the aspect of pores. And the main principle is basically burning layers of your skin and in that way stimulating production of collagen and repair. There are of course many different types of lasers and I'm not going to go into detail but the idea is basically to shock your skin system to change its aspect if you will. It works, it's fantastic, 
but I'm always a little bit suspicious of anything that is hard on one system, on one skin. So I would do it very moderately. And one thing that is very important to know specifically, it's that it's a little bit like AHAs and retinols. It really fragilizes your skin and the stains will come back. This is the type of treatment that most women in LA will do once a year. And I have to say, because I look at skins a lot, that it does create a different quality of skin. Some might love it, some might not. A type of skin that feels thinner, maybe that looks perfect, very clear, poreless, but that doesn't have the same quality as normal skin. It's a choice. And I also think that use with moderation you won't get to that result, but something more natural. Again, I hate using that word natural, but something more reasonable, but it's a choice. Botox is great for keeping the face open because Botox work on muscles. Basically, you know, if you're listening to me, you know these things. It freezes your muscles and that can really help with frown lines and relax the muscles. It shocked me at the beginning when I heard that because I thought, well, if you don't work your muscles, they get more relaxed and face muscles don't work that much. Well, on the contrary, our face muscles can get really tense and get kind of stuck into some expressions. I'm so simplifying that. I'm so sorry. But the idea is that today Botox is used to open up the face, relax those muscles, and it can work absolute wonders on frown lines, on forehead wrinkles. Some people use it on the corner of their eyes and it might work for those wrinkles there. And more and more people use it around the mouth to prevent wrinkles and different type of expressions that can get marked as we age. It's one of the tools that I think will never go away. It works really well and with everything, of course, the idea is always to pick the best people around you if you so choose to do these things to have the lightest touch possible. Third light intervention is fillers. Hyaluronic acid, which like Botox, is injected with a syringe and will take care of volumes. So that's the thing that people have been putting into their lips, for example. It's also the thing that can make these crazy cheekbones. Of course, it's very easy to describe those interventions by pointing at all the things that looks absolutely terrifying, but used with moderation, with a light touch, and with a doctor that's a little bit of an artist, it can really help with some of the volume loss. I do think that it's important to be careful. Apparently, there is a lot of issues now if you do that around the eye area. So look into that if you're looking into fillers for under your eyes, for example. Last solution would be plastic surgery. And again, no judgment about anything. One, because I believe in absolute freedom when it comes to our faces and bodies. And two, because I think some results are absolutely fantastic. And I won't talk about celebrities that don't want to talk about any interventions they have, because again, utmost respect for people's privacy. But I think it's important to point that plastic surgery can have incredibly beautiful results. And once you know that that will only work if one picks the best of the best doctors and doesn't go crazy with it, it's important to put it out there because this kind of view where it's either seen as something completely horrible that gives faces that are like completely anti-natural opposed to people who just don't say anything and just look magically like they're 35 when they're in their 60s. I don't like that. I think we should reconciliate the thing and just be able to say, yeah, sometimes it just looks magical. I also wanted to say that often when you have plastic surgery or Botox drama and celebrities get singled out for doing too much, going too far, You've seen a few scandals. There was Demi Moore and Renee Zellweger a few years ago, even Yuma Thurman. And I think that what happened there is just that they didn't take enough time for recovery, basically. And I think recovery takes a long time and that should be factored in. If you're ever thinking of plastic surgery, 
or anything else actually just think about giving yourself enough time for a great recovery without going into too many details because plastic surgery is everywhere and for everything meaning i could do a whole episode about breast plastic surgery nose mouth whatever lip lift trifecta all these things i think it's fascinating But the only thing that I'm going to say today, and that's something that a lot of older women have told me, women with experience, is that sometimes it is better to have a facelift earlier when the skin still has a lot of elasticity, that sometimes it's better to have fat transfer, which is, you know, transferring your own fat to parts of your face or your body before pumping yourself with fillers that will never look as natural. And one of the reasons is that plastic surgery has been here longer than any other intervention that I've told you about before. So the practices are really good. We also have a view on how things age, which is not the case with, for example, fillers, Botox. We don't know how fillers will age. They're supposed to be resorbable, so your body absorbs it and it goes away. So usually when you do Botox or fillers, you have to do it every six months to a year to keep the result. But it's been found a few years ago that some fillers actually don't go away. And then you have to remove them surgically. And I remember that I think it's in the 90s, women were injecting silicone into their mouths and that was all the rage. And it turns out years later that it would grow and swell in different places that were not even on the mouth and that it was impossible to remove. What I'm trying to say is that it's always better to go for the classics that have more than 20 years of having been on the market. Today, if you're thinking about a lower facelift, it's better to go for that than to do threads, for example. I've heard of so many disasters with threads. It's extremely painful. We don't know how it evolves. All those things are very new. And I think it's important not to be guinea pigs when it comes to beauty. I remember once, a long time ago, I was still kind of trying everything that people were pushing on me. And I did that thing called health therapy. And I I don't know the results. It's not something that's easy to see because you're like, well, is it all therapy or is it just me? And that's something you do to tighten uh, your jaw. That was like maybe five or six years ago. And then I heard that there were face meltdowns that happened because of that. And of course, disaster always happens. But I'm just saying, I think that there are things in plastic surgery that work beautifully and that have been done for many years and that are less dangerous because we know how they will evolve. So sometimes if you have the choice, if you're wondering, I know that for some of the people who've had disastrous outcomes, it's often because they didn't want to face the stigma of going through plastic surgery. It's easier to say, oh, I've done threads or I've done a little bit of Botox today than it is to say, oh, I've gone under and on plastic surgery. And that is why it is so important to put this conversation out there, however uncomfortable and broad and complicated it can be. Because if you're not sure how to deal with your own aging process, go see someone that does injections and they want to inject you. Go see a plastic surgeon and they want to do plastic surgery. Go see a skincare person and they'll tell you you can do it all with skincare. Add to that ideological biases, lack of honesty, and a crazy Instagram and TikTok culture with insane beauty standards, and you have all the ingredients to mess up your face and your body. When I think and choose, all of these are choices that we can only make if we're informed. If we can talk about it with people we trust, in confidence, and honesty, and yeah, not on social media. This is why I tried to be as candid as I could in that episode. And it wasn't simple because there is just so much to say. There's just so much. I hope this episode was helpful to you. I have 
an approach to aging that's very respectful to how beautiful this process can be and how no woman should aim to look the same at 50 than she was looking at 20. That is not the goal. The goal is to feel good in one's skin, to take care of oneself, and to pick the solutions that are best for us. And I think that's the best thing about today. It's the fact that we have choices. I hope you have an amazing week, and I'm sending you love. Le rendez-vous is brought to you by Doré. Doré's latest launch, La Micellaire, is a botanical micellar cleansing water that doesn't require rinsing. Minimize bathroom time and maximize outdoor time with our super simple routine. Use code PODCAST10 for 10% of your first order. Thank you for listening to Le Rendez-vous. If you want to know more about me, find out about my newsletter and my community. Find me on Instagram at Garance Doré or at my website at garance.world. And well, if you'd like to find out how to spell that crazy name, just check out the show notes. Until next time, sending you love.